All right, thank y'all. Thank you, Ray. Uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, I want to give you a read a disclaimer. Uh, I am assuming in this exercise that we are talking about an individual on a limited budget, starting on a small scale, just like I started out. I once heard Donald Trump say that he got his start with a small $1 million loan from his father. If this is your case, I'm sorry for wasting your time. So, so we're talking about uh, getting started and there's a few things I just want you to consider uh, if you're considering getting started in the hay business. And uh, first, if you're thinking about doing this, you better really like messing with hay. For some reason, my granddaddy was a hay and straw farmer and my dad hated it. My dad liked tobacco. So we got out of the hay business when I was about seven or eight years old. When I got about 20, I wanted to get back in it. And for, I guess it's just genetics. I just like those little square bales. All right, second thing, if you're gonna do this, you better like tractors and equipment and working on tractors and equipment. If you're gonna buy old stuff to get started because you're gonna be doing it a lot. Third thing, you can make money doing this, but don't do it if you're just doing it for the money because you can do other things to make more money. Next thing is expect things to go wrong. One of the biggest problems we get into is we make a plan and we don't plan for things to go wrong. We just expect it to go smooth. And lastly, consider if it was easy, everybody would do it. And that's why them two boys there don't do it no more. One's an insurance salesman and one's a furniture builder. And dad's out there by himself. First, I just want to say real quick is how I got started. Uh, is uh, I got out of the Army in, in 88, got married, and I wanted uh, to farm. And in the 80s, everybody told me, you're crazy, nobody can farm. There wasn't room on... Uh, my, my dad's farm or my granddaddy's farm. And so I asked him, I said, well, how about you let me bail your straw? So I got started in the straw business. I got a job in Nashville at a tractor uh, construction equipment business. Uh, I got that letter after I graduated college saying you are uh, uh, approved for a, a loan. So as soon as I graduated college, I bought me a brand new Ford Ranger pickup. Now this isn't it, that's my son's Nissan. Uh, so I started out, I bought a $1,500 hay baler, and the guy threw in a hay rake with it. I've still got the hay rake. And I started hauling straw on my Ford Ranger. I could get 34 bales of straw, and I'd take it to Nashville every morning as I went to work. I ran the rental department, and when somebody would come in to rent a piece of landscape equipment or dirt work equipment, I'd give them my card, and the bosses were okay with it. And I just, every morning, I'd bring straw down there and I was selling it out of the parking lot. Uh, so we want to talk, that, that's just, that's how I got started. And uh, I finally got up to where I bought a 16 foot trailer to go behind my Ranger. And I could haul 105 bales, but if the wind was blowing out of the south going to Nashville, I could never get out of third gear. Uh, real quick, we're gonna talk about finding equipment. and. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but first thing you want to know, if you're going to look for good deals on equipment, you better be willing to travel because the search tools we use these days cover a large geographical location. So uh, you're, you're not going to find the best deals just, well, I'm not saying you can't find them right down the road because I have, but you got to be willing to travel. And so when we, uh, first place, when talking about looking for equipment, the first thing that comes to mind is probably Fastline, Machine Repeat, Tractor House. I don't know if all of y'all knew this or not, but Fastline is actually based out of Kentucky. It's a Kentucky business. Uh, and we all know how to use them, looking for equipment. And you can find some deals in there. Uh, oh. Uh, then we got uh, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. I have pretty good luck on Facebook Marketplace looking for stuff. Um, is uh, because a lot of times uh, you'll find some people that really don't know what they've got or just want to get rid of something. Uh, then uh, next thing place we can find equipment is auctions, our local in-person auctions. I like those because you can actually 
see the equipment. You can even look at it and get second thoughts while you're sitting there bidding on it. What I like to do if I'm looking at something, I'm not that sharp. I listen to what other people are saying about it. And, and other people have a better eye than I do. And you might, uh, you know, you, you might hear a guy say, hey, did you look under there and see that crack in the frame? And I hadn't seen that. You know, so that when they leave, I crawl under there and I look at it. So then I decide, hey, I can fix that. So then I point out that crack in the frame to everybody else that walks by they're going to be it. You know, but if I can't fix it, I just walk away. Uh, next is uh, online auctions. Now, I'm sure most of y'all have done this, but man, you know, when you're at an auction and you're raising your hand, there's, you know, still a little bit of hesitancy, but, but that's sitting in your office totally anonymous and clicking that button, that is addictive. And uh, you have to watch that. Uh, the other thing about online auctions is buyer be aware. I will not buy anything that I don't go and see myself. And I've traveled uh, just a few weeks ago. I, my son and I drove up into Indiana to look at a couple of pieces we were going to bid on online. And the problem is, once we got back home, I started thinking, oh, I forgot to crawl under there and look at that. You know, that's the problem with online bidding. Uh, Next is networking. Uh, just tell people you're looking for some equipment, what you're looking for, other hay, hay producers, your, your, your customers, uh, friends, family, acquaintances. I, you know, people know I'm in the hay business, and when they got something to sell, or they'll call me and say, hey, you know, you, you know anybody interested in this? And um, For some reason, and I'm not the only one, but in our community, I've become the semi-van trailer guy. Everybody calls me when they're looking for a good deal on van trailers, and I tell them, well, I'll tell you like this, if I find a good deal on a van trailer, I'm keeping it for myself, and I'll sell you one of my others at regular price. Uh, businesses, uh, even ag equipment dealers. These two tractors here I got from ag dealers. Uh, the one with the loader, I had a friend. I sold him hay, and he had a 30-acre organic farm, but he didn't do organic milk, he did natural milk, so he bought his hay from me. I would carry him a semi-load of round bales and we would roll them off by hand. And then when he fed them, he rolled them to the cow lot by hand. And I said, man, you gotta get you a tractor. He said, I can't afford it. I said, I'll find you a tractor. And a friend of mine traded this in. I called the salesman, I said, what do you want for that tractor? He said, well, we allowed him 5,000, we'll take 5,000 if you'll just go pick it up at the farms. I got him that seven years ago, and I called him right last week, and he said I hadn't had a minute's trouble out of that old tractor. It's done great. Uh, the other tractor there is one I bought a couple years ago. That's the manager of the uh, Coleman tractor, a friend of mine. He called me. He said, we got an old tractor we traded. We can't sell it down here in Nashville. Would you be interested in it? So I went and bought it, and uh, it's become my favorite tractor. Uh, and then I was baling hay one day listening to the radio and on tell it and sell it this hay baler came up for sale and I thought man that is a good price so I called turned out a friend of mine had it they had just bought it to bale their own little bit of hay it hadn't done hardly anything and the price was really good so I got that off of tell it and sell it a uh, couple footnotes if if you want the most popular brand or if you want what everybody else wants expect to pay for it so I try to uh, sort of, I mean, <clears throat> you want to buy stuff you can service, but I try to find things that I can use that not everybody else in the country wants. Sometimes two or three is cheaper than one. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'll say we, that sounds better, me and my father and my son. We have 22 tractors. And all together, our 22 tractors probably wouldn't total up what one brand new one would cost. And when one of them tears up, we drag it out of the way, hook another into the hay baler, and take off. So, uh, uh, and then don't forget to add in your travel expenses to the cost of the machine. That cost. But here's what you do you got something in Kansas. You want to look at it. You just say, hon, how would you like to take a vacation in Kansas next week? And then you can move the expense for travel over to the personal vacation column, and it didn't cost you nothing toward the machine. That's why you do that. And afterwards, I am great in justifying. If anybody needs help, I'll do it for a small fee. And uh, to justify to your 
other half why you did what you did. And the other thing is the good deal catch 22. When you're looking for, you find something and all of a sudden you find out, man, that is a good deal. Your next thought is, what's wrong with it? And then you're scared to pull the trigger. You go look at it and you crawl all over it and you can't find nothing wrong with it. And you thought, boy, this problem must be really buried deep in this thing or they wouldn't be selling it this cheap. So that's just the personal thing between you and the Lord y'all got to work out. But it is hard. When you find that really good deal, you wonder what the problem is. Now we're going to talk about evaluating used equipment. And I'm, uh, I mean, I work on junk all the time, but this, is, you know, I, this isn't the gospel. I'm just going to tell you what little I've learned and what I know. But this is a 2023 John Deere 5090M. I have no idea what that is. But it's $102,000. Yeah, I'm, I'm even lost on the new numbers of equipment anymore. But it's $102,000. One thing, some things to keep in mind: the annual interest on a new piece of equipment will buy a decent used one. The payment on a new piece of equipment will buy two of them. So that's what I look at a lot. And uh, uh, another thing to think about: age does not necessarily equal wear. Uh, this is a tractor my neighbor had, and a friend of mine called, said, I'm looking for a 60, 70 horsepower tractor, and I said, I, I, got, I got a good one. And I said, now, it's ugly. I said, but it's a good tractor, because I actually serviced it and did work to it, and they bought it, and I don't think they ever put it in a barn since they bought it in the 80s. It just sat outside all the time. But I put a clutch in it. It's got brand new tires on it. It starts. It runs good. And I caught, and see the muffler's about to fall off of it. And uh, my friend came up from Chattanooga. He's, he's a young guy getting started in the hay business. And he's bought it, and he's had it a year. And the only problem he has is he's, he's an engineer, and he wants everything absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with the tractor, but he's, he's slowly taking it apart, <laughs> fixing everything on it, restoring it. But, but, you know, that was one of the worst-looking tractors I've ever seen, but it was a good tractor. Uh, don't be fooled by cosmetics, positive or negative. You got to learn to look past the lack of paint or don't let fresh paint fool you. And a friend of mine owns a trucking company and he runs just, he buys brand new plain trucks and his drivers want them fancied up and his motto is chrome don't get you home. And he won't spend any money on chrome. Uh, Consider what you're going to be doing with the piece of equipment. You know, wouldn't it be great if you could go to a, a lot and there's a hay baler sitting there and they had a sign on that hay baler saying, this hay baler has 3,000 bales left in it. You know, you, you knew that. And that's basically, you know, my concept of wear is that barn has ever how many million turns on it. And I'm one of the worst is when I get to the end of a row, I turn the machine off. It, like the bale wagon, I turn it off. Because those chains only have so many revolutions in their life. And if I can save the two minutes it takes to turn and I kick that thing back on, I've extended the life a little bit. Well, if that baler said 30,000 bales in, left in this baler, Clayton Gerald's ain't interested in that. But if some guy is getting in the business and I'm only going to be baling 2,000 bales a year, well, that's 15 years I can run that hay baler, you know, and then I can be looking for something else. So, you know, Consider how much you're going to be using something. Don't buy a really new piece of equipment that's just going to sit there. Uh, consider your mechanic and ability. This is the way I feel when I actually fix something. And I fix the stuff a lot, but I'm always surprised when it actually works. And, uh, but, uh, or consider the mechanic and ability of your friends and family. You know, and how much beer it'll take to get them to come over and help you work on it. All right, the next thing is uh, what I call the big three criteria. The year or age of a machine, the hours on it, and the resale value. Uh, I don't think that has no place in this older machinery like we're talking about today. It's all depreciated out. The number one thing you want to look at on older machinery is parts availability. I was watching something on uh, the other day on YouTube, some big dealer down south. 
and he was talking about this, and I mean some tractors that aren't, but especially with these after these uh, off-brand tractors, some of them aren't 10 years old, and they've already quit making parts for them. And he was talking about that. And uh, a good example is this. I bought this tractor 25 years ago, and it's in the shop now. Radiator got bad. I just went ahead and ordered a new radiator for it. And, uh, of course, you know, we wanted to take that out, put that in. Well, the radiator they sent us was wrong. Got checked, and they said, what's your serial number? And I got him, they said, oh. He said, when they switched from the 9,000 to the 9,600, they had about 500 radiators left over, and they stuck them in the first 500 9,600s, and you've got that. And you can't get those radiators no more. And uh, so, you know, they're... Uh, luckily mine was good enough to be record but get used to hearing the words unavailable and obsolete a lot and learn to work around it and I mean one one way to work around it is uh you know just have get one more junker sitting in the fence row to get parts off of if you need to uh now we'll talk about some things what to look for when you're evaluating the used equipment and none of these criteria are necessarily deal, break, deal breakers. It's all about knowing what you're buying and it's your decision as to what your needs are and what you can handle. And we're just going to go down through these pretty quick because they're right, I think they're in front of you in the book. But first thing we'll talk about is when you go to buy something, look at the environment. When you go up to a, and I'm not trying to run down nobody's place because my place is at the lower end of the scale. But if a guy ain't taking care of much, or things are pretty run down, there's a good chance that the equipment is sort of the same way. If if place is, is really pristine and well kept, he probably keeps his equipment pristine and well kept. So just look around. Uh, pedigree and history. What do you know about this uh, tractor? Do you know or the equipment? Do you know where it came from? Do you know uh, who? You know the previous owners? How many people have owned it? That's worth a whole lot. Uh, I collect combines. That deal in Indiana I went to that day was I found an old combine that was a one owner. Guy had bought it brand new and he'd been using it till two years ago. It was like a 70 model and uh, he put it in a sale. And just because it was a one owner combine, uh, that's why I wanted it. Uh, make and model. Uh, uh, yeah, and now, and I also want some of this. Uh, make and model, there are some pieces of equipment out there you just don't want. Uh, you know, every manufacturer has some limits. And uh, I got a friend that bought some some form of a John Deere tractor, and it turns out he had troubles, and he, every John Deere mechanic he called said, I won't even work on them because the problem you're having you can't fix. And, uh, he, and he didn't know that, and I didn't either. Uh, resale value, most of these tractors are pretty well, most of this equipment is pretty well depreciated out, but that, it's still, you know, it's still worth something when you get done with it. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, by the ton, but it's worth something. Uh, there again, parts availability. Uh, uh, huge expense on equipment is tires. That, that picture I showed you a while ago, that 6080 Alice that I bought, this was one of the tires on it. And uh, what I do when I buy an old machine, I'll run it about two years, and if I like it and it's working out pretty good, then I'll, I'll marry it, and the ring I put on its finger is a set of tires. I'll invest in a set of tires. I ran that tire for two years. So even though that's pretty bad, it's not a death sentence. I, I, I decided I'd better get it off there before it did blow out, but I ran it two years. Um... Uh, uh, look for fluid leaks, diesel leaks, transmission leaks. Uh, the location of the leak matters. You know, if it's a rear main seal, it's different than a little leak coming off a power steering pump. Uh, check your look, check your oil, all your oil levels. Check your color. Check your antifreeze. Check the color. Look for body damage. Uh, I like to look at the operator, see how wore out that is. Uh, uh, a look at wear areas, your drawbar. One thing I look at is the drawbar hitch. If it's egg shaped, boy, that thing's done a lot of work in its in its life. Um, if it's got a loader, uh, look for cracks in the frame, warped. Uh, when you start it up, how well does it start? Uh, and try to avoid to have your when you get there. Try to make sure they didn't start it, and have it warmed up when you got there. You know, because I want to see it cold start. 
you know, I'll tell them if I'm coming, don't, don't have it started. And I'll walk up and I'll touch it and make sure the engine of the manifold's not warm. I want to see it cold start. Uh, look at your engine blow by, just listen for sounds, leaks when it's warmed up, see if your gauges work, which they probably won't. Uh, when you drive it, uh, listen to your transmission rear end. And here's one a, a guy told me I hadn't thought of. What they'll do is, uh, this is a, a, an equipment dealer. He said when they go out to see about trading something in, they put it in high gear, and then they just mash the brake and choke the engine down to make sure the clutch is holding. Said, he said he has gone and looked at them, and the, the engine will just sit there and keep running and let the clutch slip when they mash the brakes. Uh, and, and check your brakes, uh, see how they are, and then steering, just uh, uh, how, how it is. And like I said, you know, this is, this is older stuff. None of this stuff's going to be perfect. You just got to figure out what you can live with and what you can't. Uh, on, uh, on equipment, um, uh, overall appearance, does it look like it's been stored inside? And I think, you know, especially hay balers and a lot of that stuff, uh, I don't have enough room. I, I always tell everybody I got a lot more toys than I got toy boxes. And most of my stuff, especially by October when every barn I got is filled to the brim with hay, a lot of my stuff is sitting outside. But I make sure my bale wagon and my hay balers get stored in and my tractors. My hay rakes uh, sit outside. I don't have enough room to put hay rakes in the barn. Uh, on the on the, on the baler, check for your plunger and your bale chamber. Uh, people, when they look at a hay baler, they go look at the nodders, and that's important. But as a guy, when I bought my very first hay baler, or the second hay baler, the guy told me, uh, he said, I was looking at the nodders, and I grew up around hay balers, and he said, everybody looks at the nodders. He said, but this plunger over here works 10 or 15 times more than the nodders, and nobody looks at the plunger bearing. He said, you need to be over here shaking the plunger, and I've learned to do that. That's what's getting doing the most work. Uh, just check your universal joints. Uh, th this list of hay equipment was given to me by my, or all this equipment was given to me by the guy that does all my hay baler and machinery work. So this is a pretty good list. Um, pickup bearings, nodders, uh, and, and a hay baler, I won't buy it unless I see, I see it run. And you can just sit there and listen to it, how smooth it's running. Uh, round balers, I don't know much about round balers. Uh, now you back them up to the tractor and put a hitch pin in. I, um, but uh, the belts, chains of belts, U-joints, pickup, roller bearings, hydraulic hoses, hay rakes, um, how much slops in the gearbox on a, on a rotary uh, uh, bar rake, U-joints, tines, bent bars. I bought a, I, I got a good deal on a hay rake a couple years ago, and I like the John Deere bar rakes because they have so many tines, they'll pick the alfalfa up a lot better than a, a, a New Holland will. And uh, a guy had one, and it was like half what I've been seeing for myself. So I went to, to buy it, but I didn't count how many teeth were missing on it. And then when I went to buy the teeth, I got it. You know, I was expecting a $1,000 rake. I paid $600, and I bought $600 worth of teeth to go on it. You know, So you can't always get a home run. <laughs> Uh, uh, of course, that was a lesson learned. And if we're going to have a contest on who's the smartest based on how many mistakes you've made, I win. I made a bunch of them. Uh, bearings, wheels, uh, cracks or, and breaks in the frame. I've seen with uh, hay rakes, cracks and breaks in the frame is uh, one of the biggest things I, I see in them all the time. Disc mowers, you know, just uh, how much slop is in the blades? Are they timed right when you turn them? Uh, the condition of the roller conditioners, um, the U-joints, and here's another thing on a lot of this new stuff is CV joints. Th those things are like made out of gold. You want to check those good, and you don't want to back your tractor around too sharp and break them, and you don't want to do that three times in one year either. I'm, I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> you know, it seemed like every operator on my farm had to learn that lesson the hard way, and myself included. Uh, Tedders, uh, U-joints, uh, tines, arms, and always be checking the bolts that hold those arms on. They're forever getting loose. Um, how much slop in the basket and tires? Okay. Uh, uh, these are just some 
actual purchases over the few, last few years, I've helped other guys. I got two or three guys I've helped sort of get started in the hay business down home, and uh, we got that from a dealer. This uh, act from for five thousand. Uh, and uh, now I bought that in nineteen ninety eight, but I got that for fifteen hundred dollars, and and I've had it. I've run it for twenty five years, and that's just as my daddy says. That's cheap horsepower. Uh, I bought that for a thousand. Turned out the guy had it wired wrong. I changed some wires around and uh, sold it for fifteen hundred. Uh, times are getting well. We're just slowing down. I can't find no much help. Uh, two years ago. I sold that tractor for $30,000, went and bought that tractor and took the difference and went and paid off a note at the bank. And uh, that old Alice hadn't missed a lick yet. Uh, this is that one that I got from my friend in Chattanooga. It was $7,000, 70 horsepower tractor with a front end loader with brand new tires on it. Uh, this is the same guy in Chattanooga. Bought a good 575 running in the, in the field in good shape, ready to go for 7,000. I think that's a pretty good price on a baler. Uh, I, I, I got this from a neighbor and I sent it to the guy in Chattanooga, a good six foot bush hog disc mower for 1500. Actually, he sold us two of them for 2500. And, uh, and they're both, uh, they were on the tractors, they were mowing waterways with them. Uh, I bought this, we're gonna, we rebuild uh, rolls in the wintertime and it's just too hard on my big baler sitting there running. My unroller ain't fast enough. So I bought this little Massey Ferguson for $2,500 and I found it on Faceline, uh, Facebook and I brought it home and I, I just wanted to play with it. I didn't even grease it. I just changed the twine in it and took off and bailed about three or four acres with it and it never missed a bale. And then we're going to get it out here in the next week or two and start bailing uh, in the barn with it. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I, what got this started, somebody asked Clayton if a young person could get started, and I was on a Facebook group, and somebody, some guy put on there, it was a, a group that, uh, about hay equipment. He said, I got 10 acres, me and my mom, what can I do with that 10 acres to make some money? And I said, well, grow alfalfa. And I got laughed off the page. And uh, so I just uh, made a, a little fantasy farm here. And so all this equipment uh, that I've, uh, I've know I can buy, I've, uh, that's it right there, and that's basically, which a lot of people, if you're going to start, a lot of them already got a tractor, you know, stuff like that, but this is what we would buy uh, to get going on a small scale, total cost, and I'm allowing a little bit for repairs, total equipment cost 15000 if you spread that over five, 000, uh, five years, that's $3,000. Now, don't people critique my budget too bad. I just threw this up there. But, I mean, those prices are good. They're, they're current fertilized prices, everything like that. Your total expenses would be about $427. Now, uh, if you average 200 bales to the acre, and most years I do, if you can get 10, I also got it figured on my paper here at, at 180 bales at 8, but 200 bales at $10, uh, get on down there, uh, that leaves you, after all your expenses, on 10 acres, you would net $15,726. Then you subtract out your, that $3,000 a year equipment cost. That leaves you making $12,700 on a 10-acre field behind your house. So there's a lot of other stuff to work out. I realize that. But, you know, that's just a, a for instance that, that it can be done. Because I actually started with nine acres of alfalfa. So... All right, that's it. Thank you all. Do I have time for a question? Yeah. No, no, I don't reply to that stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll be here all day. Yeah. Okay.